before there was an entire money-making studio dedicated to pumping out movies and TV shows based on the vast and ever-expanding catalog of Marvel Comics characters, we were seeing the likes of Sam Raimi making the Sony Spider-Man trilogy and Jonathan Hensley delivering an interesting and gritty take on the Punisher. Before that, we had the iconic Blade movies and some solid X-Men fare, all movies that we've covered in previous episodes of this show. Or have we? See, it's easy to do a Marvel series that praises the Raimi trilogy and roasts the goofiness of the Tim Story Fantastic Four films, but today is going to be one hell of a throwback for any Marvel fan who grew up in the 1980s. Before the dawn of mutants and the day-walking vampire hunters, there was a much different Marvel hero blasting their way into the zeitgeist and giving us what many consider to be the true beginning of Marvel cinema. I guess not including the 70s Japanese Spider-Man film or that small screen Captain America joint. The old people around here are my friends. And if I ever hear they have problems again, I'm coming after you. You got that? So let's wind the clocks back to 1986 and revisit Marvel's first theatrically released film ever. It's a story about belonging, fulfilling your purpose against all odds, and a woman's biker gang called Satan Sluts. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I guess I'll just start by saying... In the beginning there was... Howard the Duck. Alright true believers, today we're taking a short break from our current timeline and bringing you a shot of nostalgia that is sure to ruffle your feathers. If you're a fan of Marvel's more cosmic characters or you're into 80s science fiction comedies, you're probably familiar with Howard the Duck, a humanoid duck creature who lives on Duck World, which is basically an egg-shaped version of Earth where ducks have evolved into wingless, super-intelligent beings who live their life pretty much the same as humans do on Earth. Howard is a marketing specialist who is suddenly sucked out to Earth and firmly planted in Cleveland. Or is it Cleveland? Cleveland? Uh-huh. Either way, he's confused, he's alone, and he's having some trouble making friends. When Howard meets Beverly, a Cindy Lopper looking local musician played by the wonderful Leah Thompson, who you would know as the mom from Back to the Future, the two become fast friends and seek to figure out how the hell Howard got to Cleveland and how to get him back home. Along the way, we're in for some hilarious comedic gags, fun action scenes, and who could forget that quirky and hammed up performance from Tim Robbins. I want you to look into the future and tell me what you see. Howard the Duck was created by comic strip writer Steven Gerber in 1975 as a supporting character to the moderately popular horror parody comic series Adventure into Fear. In 1977, Marvel attempted to give Howard the Duck his own spin-off series of comic strips, which lasted for about a year before going out of print. In an interesting and ironic turn of events, Disney reached out to Marvel mentioning legal action because the design of Howard was originally too similar to that of Donald Duck, a classic Disney cast member. Marvel opted to change the design to avoid any legal trouble, but how funny is it that all these years later, the character of Howard and the character of Donald are both owned by the House of Mouse. Every duck's got his limit, and you scum have pushed me over the line. After directing the classic film American Graffiti, George Lucas himself began expressing interest in adapting this comic strip hero into live action. Lucas took a producer credit on the film and let director Willard Hike develop the screenplay he'd written with Gloria Katz, and the film went into production in the fall of 1985. Originally, the movie was meant to be a bit darker and would have seen less comedic moments intertwined in the story, although I would argue that that's part of why the movie was a box office failure, being that it didn't really know who it was for. I also think the movie is pretty great when it comes to the laughs. You know, this is beginning to seriously undermine my self-esteem. The movie starts with an opening title sequence that introduces us to Howard and his planet. It's basically the same as Earth, but all ducked up. Howard is in his late 20s and he has just started a career in marketing, despite originally wanting to be an entertainer. He's just kicking back in his apartment reading his Play Duck magazine when he's shot out of his apartment and sucked to Earth with no explanation. 
The movie definitely feels 80s in the visual look of it, as well as its amazing soundtrack. I can't speak for everyone here, but the 80s is easily one of my favorite eras for cinema. So, Howard doesn't know where he is, but he quickly notices that he must be far away from home because he notices that everyone he sees is… well, not a duck. And vice versa, the humans don't seem to be too thrilled about Howard either. Do you like see what I see? A talking duck? Howard gets himself into some trouble when he meets Beverly. He's sitting in a trash can, feeling down on himself when Beverly shows up and she's being attacked by the most 80s looking thugs I've ever seen. Don't go snot nose on us, we your biggest fans. Yeah. Let me go! <laughs> Howard jumps to the rescue for Beverly and while the two don't immediately hit it off, they basically become besties right away. And Howard is now staying in Beverly's apartment while she offers to help him find his way back home. The first half of this movie definitely gives similar vibes to the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle film, with Leah Thompson taking on the human handler role and Howard playing the intelligent super animal creature role. Only there may or may not be some weird will they won't they romance between the two and I <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I just can't resist your intense animal magnetism. Although I must admit that Howard's humor, his confidence, his little quips, they're all very lovable and the character genuinely makes you care about what happens to this five-fingered duck thing. The pair had to find a scientist who may be able to explain what happened to Howard. And that's when we're introduced to the very first major role that Tim Robbins ever played in a movie. Phil Blumbert. It's nothing! <laughs> it's nothing! Never mind! <laughs> Phil is an assistant scientist with no real authority or access, but plenty of excitement. Robbins really plays up the dorky science goober trope, but man, I'll be good goddamned if he isn't chewing up the scene at every corner. Phil kind of joins the posse and decides to befriend and help Howard and Beverly, but their mission isn't gonna be easy. The movie has a lot of scenes that involve Howard simply trying to adapt to his living situation on Earth, and these scenes are some of the funniest moments in the whole movie. Particularly, there's one scene where Howard is forced to get a job delivering towels to the patrons of some underground sex club. Actually, I don't know what the hell this place is. Like, what the hell is going on here? And who are these people? And why the hell is this guy so sweaty? You are going to fix it! <laughs> oh no. Either way, it's all funny stuff. Also, Howard can't swim, <laughs> and I love that. It isn't long before we discover how Howard got to Earth, and why. Turns out the scientists that Phil was working with were messing around with some scientific laser that was aimed toward Duck World, and it accidentally sucked Howard to Earth. They think they should be able to send him back to his planet using the reverse of the same experiment, and Howard is all set to go. But of course, it can never be that easy. That must be quite a responsibility. Tonight. The laser beam hit the nexus of Sominus. It just so happens that an evil life form from a distant planet has also made its way to Earth, and it possesses Dr. Jenning, one of the scientists trying to help Howard. This causes the machine to malfunction and effectively begins to blow Howard's chances of getting home. After a nice big fight in a diner, it hit me that this movie's action is actually way more fun than you might think. There's an energy to it that feels very whimsical, like watching the three ninjas or something, and it definitely keeps you engaged. Beverly has been kidnapped by a possessed Dr. Jennings, and now Howard is left to try to figure out how to defeat him. And it's time for the final battle. That's it. No more Mr. Nice Duck. It all culminates in the dark overlord kidnapping and attempting to use Beverly's body to host another demon from his planet. See, Howard has to face the tough choice as he can save Beverly and effectively destroy his only shot at getting home, or let his one and only friend be taken over by an evil alien. He obviously decides to do the former, and he teams up with Phil to take the bastard down by using an ultralight plane, a neutron disintegrator, and even the power of friendship. And of course, Howard stays on Earth with his new friends and they all live happily ever after. Not bad for a duck from outer space. You were great, ducky. You know, this movie 
is awesome. It was critically panned and it didn't make any money, only pulling in about 38 million on a budget of about 38 million. But over the years, the film has earned its place among other fare that has joined the ranks of cult classic films. And the character of Howard the Duck has made a few cameos in the MCU as well, so we know that the poor reception of this movie isn't going to stop Marvel from bringing him back in future projects one way or another. This is obviously no place for an intelligent, sensitive duck. It's a movie that has the 80s comedy style of a John Hughes film, but the science fiction spectacle of something like Gremlins. And it's raunchy, too. We see things like duck boobs, duck condoms, and who knows what the hell ended up happening between Beverly and Howard. I mean, Jesus. You perverts! But at the end of the day, the film was a fun shot of nostalgia, and if nothing else, it demonstrates how far Marvel has come since. But also, how much imagination has kind of been stripped from Marvel at the same time. This movie would not fit into the MCU today, no. But honestly, it does have something to it that the MCU doesn't. There's an edge and a daring nature to the comedy that pushes past what we're used to seeing, and the way the movie unfolds makes for a truly interesting story with a very lovely character at the center of it. So I'm just gonna end by saying, if you haven't seen this movie, do yourself a favor and check it out. I said beat it! <laughs> Mutants.